I'll pass to David Limbrick, MLC. MLC. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Premier, for appearing today. You're not on the screen at the moment, but um, is there anything with the... No, it's just, the it's just that the Zoom right. is split okay. to the Secretary. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thank you for appearing today. Um, it's one of my tasks to uh, champion the cause of liberty of Victorians, so it would be remiss of me not to start there. So what would you say to... Um, the, the pandemic response has involved uh, significant suppression of individual and social liberties of Victorians. What assurances can you provide Victorians that all of those liberties will eventually be returned? Uh, Mr Limerick, thanks very much for your question uh, and for uh, the way that you've, uh, I suppose, provided me with some, some, some comments and a bit of a frame for, for the questions you're going to ask. Uh, look, I think a lot of Victorians have given up a lot uh, and I suppose the suppression, I wouldn't necessarily agree with you at the way you've characterised the rules, but what I'd say to you is uh, the suppression that we've been most focused on is suppressing this virus and that if it gets away from you, as I've said many times and I think as the international evidence bears out, there's no pulling it back, not without many tens of thousands of people dying. And whilst I... Uh, I'll give you one, one example. I've been criticised by a few people who would much prefer to have been playing golf than not playing golf. Uh, I don't think it's a fair comparison to compare missing a Wednesday afternoon game of golf with someone losing their job. I'm not saying you're making that comparison, but other people have. Uh, there are some people who've lost their lives. Uh, these are tough decisions and everyone's expected to make a contribution because everybody benefits, Mr Limbrick, in uh, us containing this, us suppressing this virus, a successful strategy benefits everybody ultimately, because if this gets away from you, regardless of any individual measure, no family would be spared, no family would be uh, untouched by this. You can't have literally tens of thousands of people die and not have every single Victorian involved in that. They would be in many different many different ways. Now, we've got a job of work to do uh, to get back to, to, new, to, to a new normal for a period of time. Once a vaccine comes, then hopefully we can get back to uh, normal in every sense. Uh, we're not a gov we're a government that has always been uh, supportive of uh, fairness uh, and being as proportionate as possible. We have had to take extraordinary measures, but these are extraordinary times. And Victorians have delivered an extraordinary outcome, Mr. Limbrick, uh, one that uh, many countries simply can't boast. Um, there's been a lot of talk of unprecedented, so an unprecedented. Uh, threat from the virus and unprecedented actions required to deal with it and unprecedented, um, as I would call, uh, suppression of uh, individual and economic liberties. And that has caused also unprecedented harms. Could you outline for Victorians um, what are some of those harms that you see have been caused by uh, these restrictions on liberties and um, were they in line with what you would have predicted when they were um, when they were considered? That's a very good question, and it's uh, it's something that we, uh, I suppose, will reflect on and, and monitor in real time because some of those, uh, some of the cost of this, some of the damage that's uh, inevitably been done and, and had to be done in order to prioritise life and, and, and the protection of, of public health. Some of those consequences are quite obvious to us now. We are heading towards an unemployment rate that we've not seen for a very long time. Uh, we are uh, heading into uh, a, a period already we've seen and will continue to see uh, damage to many, many businesses, particularly those that are, if you like, on the front line, those that have been most directly affected. But again, uh, there's uh, supply chain issues. There's issues across the whole Victorian uh, economy. Uh, there will be issues of mental health and wellbeing. Uh, there'll be there'll be issues in relation to uh, many different impacts. I, I don't think we should shy away from uh, having a mature discussion about that. I thank you for the question. It's a very important one. Uh, we give due consideration to all the impacts of all the decisions we make. And, and sadly, uh, it's not a binary thing. It's sadly not a situation where we can make one choice that will be 100% good. Uh, uh, versus a choice that would be the exact opposite. Sometimes to deliver the greatest good for the greatest number, we have to make that very difficult choice uh, where we know there will be damage, we know there will be harm, and that's why National Cabinet, as a Cabinet of Unity, a unique forum, 
uh, has weighed these issues up very, very carefully. So has AHPPC, so has Professor Sutton, so have my Cabinet colleagues, and indeed that's part of the work that PAYAC is doing too. Um, I thank the Premier for your answer. Um, with regards to these decisions, um, there's been a lot of talk about following the advice of the Chief Health Officer. Has there been instances where the Chief Health Officer has made a recommendation for either more restrictions or more easing that, um, you, that you may have pushed back against and actually not taken their advice? Have you taken... So what I'm asking is really, have you taken all of their advice or have you pushed back against some of the advice because you see other harms that may, that may have existed? No, I think that uh, you'd, you would best summarise the partnership between the government, who has ultimate responsibility for these decisions, and the Chief Health Officer, who's got a very clear set of responsibilities under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act. I wouldn't call it pushing back or uh, that that's not a relationship that's defined by tension. Uh, He'll provide advice. We'll often ask questions. We may have an idea. We may think about doing something and then we want him to test that. We want his view on that. So it's a lot of back and forth. And that's why, uh, whilst there was some questioning earlier about can, can we point to a precise meeting, there's literally hundreds of discussions, perhaps more than that, actually. Uh, and, and it's a really important process. Uh, I would say to you, there is one example. Um, there was an order made in relation to partners who were in a relationship but didn't live in the same household. I was asked yes. a question about it. I instinctively backed the Chief Health Officer. Uh, he then, uh, conveniently for partners who don't live in the same house, but, un but inconveniently for me, he decided to change his advice later that day. Uh, so I think there's been common sense and some flexibility come to this as well. Uh, but I can't think of an example where he's told us to act and we've said no. Uh, if anything, we've probably been more cautious, uh, as a state that is, uh, than probably the consensus position at the Australian Health Principles Protection Committee. Uh, uh, thank you for your answer, Premier. Um, on to another topic. Early on in the pandemic response, there was much talk about uh, military involvement and how uh, defence personnel might be used. Um, I think many people imagined that there would be soldiers running around the streets and that hasn't really eventuated. But it's my understanding that a number of defence uh, personnel were assigned to contact tracing. Could you please describe how, uh, how those <coughs> personnel have actually been used in contact tracing? Mr Liebrich, it's a good question. Uh, and I think coming off the bushfires, we were, there was a real sense of confidence that if we needed to again forge that partnership between our emergency services, our public service and the Australian Defence Force, that just like we did in bushfires, we'd be able to do that together. I don't have specific examples of exactly what role the ADF has played. I'm happy to get that for you. And in fact, Professor Sutton might be able to give you some of those uh, details later on. And if you don't want to use up time questioning, I'm more than happy to get that for you. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll write back to the committee. I think you're right to say that early on, there was a sense that we might need some ADF support. Uh, I think we have received some, uh, but nowhere near as much as we thought we might. We just, we haven't made the request because we haven't needed to. Although I would point you to, for instance, uh, uh, another outbreak that's been handled uh, in the view of our public health experts uh, uh, very, very well, of course, down in northwest Tassie, uh, where uh, ADF did play a significant role in locking that community down uh, and uh, containing that outbreak. So we'd always like to think, I think, as uh, uh, taxpayers, as uh, our members of our uh, local communities, as well as proud Australians, that uh, in times of crisis, in times of need, it wouldn't matter what colour uniform people wear. It wouldn't matter whether they get a federal paycheck or a state one. Uh, all of our experts, all of our uh, brave uh, men and women who serve us uh, would come together and operate uh, as one team. Uh, I'm more than happy to try and get you some information about exactly how much work uh, the, the ADF has done for us. But it's, it, it, if ultimately it's a relatively small number, that's no reflection on them. It just means that the need, there was need elsewhere, uh, or there was uh, simply not the need that we thought there might be, just knowing that they were ready and willing and able to support us if we needed them, I, I think was a great comfort to those in the public health team. Uh, thank you, Premier. I would appreciate more details on the military sure. involvement in the pandemic. Um, uh, another thing that I've noticed is that um, since there's been a general suppression of uh, the liberties of Victorians, there have been certain groups that like the things that are banned, uh, they would like them to remain banned. 
Um, and there's, I could probably give a number of examples of that. So, you know, some people don't like gambling and they would like it to remain prohibited. Some people don't like duck shooting. Mr Hibbins uh, provided an example. The, the, in fact, there's a number of these things. Um, yep. What would you say to those groups that are using this situation to push for these things? Will you defend against those further restrictions on liberty? Well, what I'd say to you, Mr Limbrick, is that people are entitled to have their own views. And I don't think anyone, say, on gambling has formed a view just during the pandemic. They probably came to this pandemic with a yes. with a, a pretty firm view on whether gambling was good, bad or indifferent. Uh, to, to stick with that example, my view has always been that uh, gambling is a perfectly legitimate uh, rec rec recreational activity. Um, uh, going to the pub to have a beer is a perfectly legitimate uh, activity. There will be minorities of Victorians who can't do that responsibly and we should support them. That's what we've always always done. Uh, restrictions made for the pandemic end when the pandemic ends. Uh, this is not an opportunity to almost by stealth make other changes. Uh, uh, gaming, for instance, uh, is a legitimate form of recreational activity. I acknowledge not everybody believes the same thing I do. Not everyone agrees with me on that. Uh, but we're not looking to make those sorts of substantive changes under cover of a global pandemic. So in short, uh, these restrictions have been made to keep people safe in a public health sense because of a pandemic. And when that risk passes, so too will the restrictions that we have put in place. Um, I don't have much time left, but one point was um, you brought up New York, Paris and London, these other cities that have had terrible responses. And yet some other cities, such as Bangkok, Bang Baghdad and New Delhi, haven't really suffered uh, great problems with the pandemic. How can we be sure that, the, that, the, that our actions are effective uh, as compared to these other cities? Because it doesn't seem very clear uh, in all cases. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Premier, yes. um, Mr Limbrick's time has expired. Um, you might provide an answer to that question. Thank you. I'm more than happy to provide that in writing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Premier.